Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our ninth uh, React online uh, online meetup. Uh, we are here after a six week pause, so we hope that you all are well rested uh, after the summer and all the vacations. Uh, probably in current situation, only walks in the nature were on the list. Uh, but uh, we are really excited now that you made the decision to join us today for, for the online meetup. And during the summer, we were not slacking around uh, just like that, uh, but we were working really hard to bring you uh, the next meetup, which will be about the hot topic right now, and that is GraphQL. So you can look forward to two dev talks uh, currently. The first is from our speaker, Alexander Goncharo, about GraphQL databases beyond GraphQL. And the second one about well-known uh, for people who are uh, watching this for a longer time, Gerard Sanz, uh, who was a host uh, at some meetups uh, about offline first, uh, made easy with GraphQL and Amplify Data Store. Uh, just to introduce myself, I will be host uh, today evening, and my name is Andy. I'm from Vacuum Labs, uh, which is a company that stays behind uh, the Reactive Conf uh, from its beginning in 2015. Vacuum Labs is focused on providing flexible and reliable software engineers to clients all over the, over the world, uh, focusing mainly on fintech uh, and crypto. Uh, the first uh, or the two things that are worth mentioning just before the meetup or the talks starts is that uh, QA, Q &A, uh, that means that uh, you can ask uh, questions during the meetup in the chat, uh, which is accessible in your Zoom windows uh, on the lower left, left side. Uh, we will get eventually to all the questions uh, after the talk, so feel free to ask. Uh, I will then uh, read them uh, aloud and the speaker will answer. Uh, if we will not manage to answer all the questions, we will move to Slack, which is the second point uh, that there is an active Slack channel, reactive online uh, meetup.slack.com. Uh, uh, where you can find the channel to this meetup and also the previous meetups, so you can check out the history. Uh, there was uh, some really great discussion about micro frontends last time, so so you can watch it there. Uh, you find the recording and everything, so uh, it's a great community there and uh, some active di discussion. So feel free to join uh, and also continue to talk with the speakers, which are present there. Uh, uh, so that's pretty much it from me for 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 now, and uh, let's uh, jump in uh, directly to to the first Dev Talk uh, from Alexander Goncharo. So Alex, hey, are you here? How are you? Good day. I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm also great. Uh, I'm excited for for the talk. Uh, we all have all have been hearing about the GraphQL for a really long time. Some of us have definitely tried it, some maybe not. So we are really all excited about the graph data. I would be happy Forward. to pro provide some other side of graphs and it's also gonna touch on GraphQL as well. So we'll see. I hope people will like it. Yep, for sure. Uh, so stage is yours. Uh, let's okay. go for it. Try let's to share go the screen. It. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you everyone for your time and thank you for joining. I hope you like this talk and it's about graph databases and it's something that goes beyond GraphQL and we'll see why in a minute. So Allow me to quickly give a small disclaimer is that GraphQL is not graph database, at least in a native way, but GraphQL can be used with graph databases if that's something really powerful. So let's see what all the fuss is about. What's a graph? And let's start simple. Uh, we can see that we have some like schema here, which is Adam, Eve, and 
So these nodes we would refer as entities or vertices or rather some objects, but these objects can have some connection or relationship between them. And that's essentially what the graph is. It's pretty simple, right? Well, it can get really complicated, really fast, but that's fine, don't worry. So just to sum up, my name is Alex. I work at Muse as a front-end developer, and you can see it's all in the graph. So that's easy, right? But do we actually need graph databases in general? Hmm, that's a good question because we've been solving all the databases stuff with relational databases pretty solid in the last decade. If you would like to represent such schema as room and category, you would probably easily would create something like this. You have a table of type room, you have a table room category, and you can create a join table or bridge table that basically can provide you with many, many to uh, many to many relationship pretty easily. And if you like to go somewhere deeper, you can make multiple of these. And this seems to work really good and nobody seems to be complaining. But here's the thing, like these relationships never present. We have some limitations on these foreign keys, but if I would just shuffle around some cards around, you already have a really hard time to replicate it because we only rely on these IDs. So these relationships are actually illusional. Okay, many actually call this as really, really smart way, uh, object relational impedance mismatch. And it's something that ORM help us to solve or rather abstract from, but let's not focus on it too much. The thing is with ORMs is that ORMs have problems with joins because once you start to forget about these relationships and how it works under the hood, you actually hit in performance really badly. And many people of you already start to use GraphQL, right? It's wonderful technology. But usual case how it's represented right now is that we have some client which goes to the uh, GraphQL endpoint, which is somewhere next to backend, or at least somewhere near it. And this backend then generates SQL query. Well, which is good, but the thing is, it's not graph all the way and this conversion feels some, some like that to me, like really all the parts are here, but somehow it's not solid. Now let's talk about a bit more interesting case. Let's put our GraphQL gateway somewhere next to backend, but it's totally independent. So it can work with backend logic or business logic whenever it needs to, but sometimes you would actually can avoid backend altogether in some way, just using the gateway. And this way you can provide uh, some public APIs without even utilizing any kind of business logic, which is actually really good. And on top of that, all your connections are actually graph based and that provides some really powerful outcomes to which we're gonna talk in a second. So do we actually need graph databases? Hmm. The usual way to approach it if you have really highly connected data, probably yes, but let's go with some specific scenarios. Fraud detection, you have a lot of data, you don't exactly know how things are connected and you need to find something. Well, usually graphs are really good with that. AI, you think about simple neural network or perceptron, well, it's actually a graph where weights of the neural network is actually on edges of this network. Hmm. Another good example for it. Recommendations engine. Well, it's just a huge neural network, if you think about it, with applied analytics on it. Works good. Another approach uh, is network operations and mapping. This is, if you would like to imagine it, imagine you have a country and it's provided with internet via several uh, networks of routers, and you want to find out one, if it fails, it actually can cut off half of the country. Well, that's where graphs shine. Okay. But if you'd like to use graph databases, you have to understand like one thing only. In graphs, nodes are just as important as relationships. And that's super powerful. And you would like to use graph, 
you'll probably use some kind of query language for it. Cypher is very popular. It's from Neo4j. It's all right. There is a Gremlin as well. And actually last year, September, it was proposed to go with GQL, which is actually a standard what this should be. We will see for it, but I have more happy news for you. The GraphQL actually is gained as a really standard language for querying and databases. If you take a dgraph, it actually utilizes GraphQL. So that's good news. So why graphs? If I would ask you to create some kind of system or some thinking process, there is a good chance that you will go ahead and start drawing UMLs or mind maps or whiteboards. And most of the time, they're probably going to be looking some like graphs to you, which is exactly how I was thinking process. It's natural. So with this in mind, allow me to do some small demo for you. This is something specific for our system at News, but I, I think you're going to be like really easy with it. Uh, we would like to select some room with name 701. And if you look at it, this is Cypher query. But if you transfer, translate it to SQL language, it's something like that. It's not too complicated. Let's run it. OK, I just got some results with some kind of room here. So if I click on it, that's a room. Just a specific our system, it's also a resource because we believe that room is a resource of the hotel. And you can see some properties over here as well. Now, let's just forget that we are like computer scientists, all of this. We're just playing again here. If I double click on this node, wow, some new stuff pops up. We can actually traverse graph without any knowledge of coding whatsoever. We're just playing a game. And we can see that this perfect hotel and this room, they have some relationship between each other. And it's actually room belongs to this hotel. It's good. But we also have an order connected to this room. Let's click on it. Whoa, some more new stuff comes up. It's actually a reservation and it has some people attached to it. So we have like this good friend of ours. We have a person who made a reservation and we have some companions. So it's really easy, it's interesting, and it's fun. We can go ahead and see all the way. So here's the bill. This bill has a payment. Uh, payment is processed and it processed with this payment card. And if you click on the payment card as well, what we see is that this payment card connected to the worker. Now, remember I've been talking about fraud detection. Imagine if this order would have somehow really strange total. Well, even without technical knowledge, we will be able to traverse this order to the person who works at this hotel. Aha. Uh -huh. So this is interesting and we can actually action on it, but let's not do that. Let's do some other example. I know that it's like scary times right now, but that's also specific to our industry and to the world in general. Let's try to find out if our friend John over here has somebody who is connected to Corona or is infected with Corona. Let's try it. So to do that, I have another query prepared. It's really simple if you just read it out loud. So I'm looking for the path from customer, which is our friend John over here. That's his email. So I just find the person by email and I just go ahead and say whatever the relationships between like this node and this node i don't care if they're just up to four whatever it can be and here's we have infection which is covered and we would like to find this path let's try it so i'll just run this query and let's see okay we found something so this is our friend he has a reservation with a companion and companion is actually infected with COVID. Oh, that's scary. But if you look at this relationship, we can see that it actually was created actually several months ago. So it might be not even relevant anymore. We should not be so afraid though. But we can go somewhere deeper. 
what if we try to do something like that? First of all, what we do is that we also find this infection and we find this connection, but we specify that it's up to seven hops. And we also say that the uh, infection period was somewhere between uh, 7th of September and 24th of September. Let's try to see what happens. Okay, we found something. So we see that our friend over here has a reservation with a friend who visited a restaurant. By the way, if you're gonna be in Prague, I highly recommend this Hanabi restaurant called Sushi there. And there is another person who visited this restaurant and he lives with someone who is infected with corona and the infection happened 11th of September. Like it's sad news, but at the same time, we can action on it and even warn someone, or we can say that this room has, a, has to have a more thorough cleaning. So this is something we can action on. And what I wanted to stress out over here is that this query over here does not specify any of the relationships. And it just really performant in terms of hopping around. It's something really hard to do with SQL, or actually I would say it's impossible. So that's where graph shine. So let's go back to our presentation over here. There are a lot of myths about graph databases. Hmm. It's the most usual one. The graphs are really slow to write to. And that's really strange, but I tried to write uh, 100,000 random users into database. It took me like 15 seconds on graph, uh, Neo4j actually, and 24 seconds on SQL. It proves absolutely nothing. We're just comparing oranges to, to apples and it's just two different things. But just be aware, the write is actually not, not important. Now, join limits. That's something I often hear about people who use uh, GraphQL because people say like, don't go too deep into relationship. And the reason they say don't go too deep is actually because SQL, because SQL have to do all these joins. In graphs, as we've just seen, it's actually really natural to traverse all these relationships. It can do it pretty fast. So that's another myth. But if you would like to compare things, graphs are really good with connected data and in an obvious relationship as you would like to do this example before or if you would go to some uh, fraud detection. It's also really good in uh, path of three traversal as you can see. But if you're talking about SQL and low connected data, it wins. If it's strict relationships, it wins. If it's flat structure, it wins. So we have to understand too. And if you like to get some shiny slide to put, so GraphQL has minuses as well, of course. It's not very popular. Uh, well, SQL, you can probably find it on any, any shared hosting whatsoever. Graph uh, database actually provides data deduplication where you don't have to create several instances of things just to make things faster. You can actually create a single node and it has uh, multiple labels. While in SQL, you have to duplicate data sometimes so that there is no joins. And if you ask me, how would I use it? Well, I would use graphs in my social network, but I totally would use SQL for my bank account. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, have fire away, or you can ask them directly on my Twitter. As well, I recommend to join NewsDev's Twitter. There is a lot of cool articles. People are really good there. And the most important part, go ahead and try graphs yourself. It's really easy. Just search for Neo4j or dgraph. They're both good. Neo4j is a bit more academical, while dgraph is a bit more practical. But you can have a feel of both of them. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alexander, very much for your presentation. It was really insightful. Uh, I don't think that we have any questions in the in the chat, uh, but I would have a few by myself if you allow. Absolutely. Uh, the, the the first is that uh, the, I'm pretty I'm pretty used to just traversing the the data or some 
visualization of data in the SQL. That's pretty straightforward. You have just a bunch of tables. Uh, you can imagine it like an Excel and you just browse data there. Maybe maybe do some aggregations or something uh, or some functions uh, over over the rows and uh, that 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 can be pretty simple or it's something that I'm used to. Uh, how do you just visualize and maybe traverse data in this graph databases? Because from my point of view, it currently seems like that something uh, which is maybe moderately populated uh, a, a database with a lot of relationships may be a, 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 a little messy. Because for example, I had a, I, I, I had this uh, this JavaScript bundle, which I tried to, to, to uh, or maybe better, I tried to visualize the relationships between my files in the JavaScript project, uh, who is import, importing uh, what. So, 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 and this even for a moderately big project was a little messy. Like my computer was burning absolutely. If I tried to zoom in on some specific relationship or some specific subgraph. So, do you have experience with this? Is there some 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 good way to to do this? Uh, well, th that's that's really really good example. Um, first of all, what you've just seen is a native. Uh, browser for Neo4j and it's actually pretty performant I have to say. I think it utilizes uh, D3 if I'm not mistaken mm -hmm. but it's quite all right. Uh, like I didn't try such issue whatsoever but what I tried is when I have like a lot of data is of course to filter it and it's possible to hide some things because it's mm -hmm. just visually impossible to get everything by yourself and mm -hmm. one thing is uh, possible of course to return what you need to see. And mm -hmm. another thing that I didn't show here, because usually it's not so impressive for people, but uh, in Neo4j, you can actually display data in different ways. You can display it as graphs, you can display it as tables, and even can display it as uh, raw data, which is scary. <laughs> but like, think about your question. I think it's gonna be really hard to visualize uh, like file structure easily there. It's gonna be really messy. And I think somebody even done this uh, 3D space with uh, graphs and nodes going all minority report there, <laughs> which is actually amazing with VR. <laughs> so that's something you can try. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, the, the relation, re relational database or, or the, the simple table is, uh, is, is by definition is just two, two dimensional. Uh, but but these graphs, I can definitely ima imagine this going to 3D or, or or even even some something something more totally something totally. more expressive than just uh, looking at uh, like it's plotted uh, on the on the on the plane, and you just have to zoom in and look at uh, all the arrows just going uh, one through the other, and uh, and and uh, just couldn't make the sense out of it. I can imagine like, like you can grab your files and delete them. There is a virtual trash you just put there. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. Uh, we have one question from the audience and that's a technical one. Uh, does Neo, Neo4j support uh, GQL? Actually, I'm not sure that GQL is actually yet uh, ready. Uh, so. I don't think it at this moment does support it. So there is no agreement at the point how it's gonna be. They do try it and recently they actually published a post that they, they try to cooperate on it. I'm not sure it is out yet. But if you'd say GQL in terms of GQL as standard uh, graph language or you'd say in GQL as GraphQL. Because I'd say, say that, that this is meant as a GQL as the standard you mentioned, mm -hmm. as I understand okay. it from this question. Because yeah, I think GQL is not out yet. Oh okay, okay. So so At least that, no that's as as far as I know. <laughs> uh, and there is another one from 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 the same person, uh, and also pretty specific. Do you know how much the DGraph enterprise package self-hosted cost, or what figures to expect? They do not list the pricing on their website, and I'm particularly interested in access control list feature. 
I'm not aware about that. To be honest, like yep. I bumped into uh, DeGraff quite recently. I didn't have much experience with them. I just played it, visit a bit. Uh, most of the time I was using Neo4j, but DeGraff is surely interesting kid on the block. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the next question, interesting one. Can you enforce some kind of schema in Neo4j or, or DeGraph or are, are they totally schemaless like MongoDB? For example, they are schemaless, so it it comes up with all the trade-offs. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, and uh, maybe my last question for you would be that there is a lot of theory about uh, just uh, uh, optimizing your queries in 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 SQL and how to write performant queries, and also the the engines like PostgreSQL are heavily optimized and doing a lot of like magic and heuristics just to make it run really fast. Uh, and uh, I can imagine that at least from what I, what I recall from, from, uh, from college is that uh, the, the, the gr just going through the graphs or doing some computation over graph is, is not always performant when, when we are looking at some Dijkstra algorithms or, or something uh, which is done over a graph like you can expect some higher time time complexity or or something so is there some some theory or 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 some some comprehensive like notion or or book or community about how to write performant queries over the graph databases first of all the thing i would totally recommend is uh most of the time the good uh graph structure helps <laughs> that's one thing yep. <laughs> so you avoid all these loops and all of things yeah uh, other thing is of course um as just with sql you can do so-called um, explain and it's gonna tell you how the, the graph was traversed and how it was working mm -hmm. uh talking about even algorithms uh neo4j community has a standard library for algorithms and they actually provide exactly the extra like um, uh, a lot of them, like uh, sh uh, all shortest path, all of it mm -hmm. would be just work for you out of the box. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. of course you have to understand it, but at the same time, some of the things just go for free for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds interesting. I would definitely dig deeper in some of my free time. Uh, that was a great inspiration. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank I'm you very much. Work. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, have a great evening. Oh, you too. Uh, <laughs> cheers. And cheers. Uh, let's move uh, to our second talk by Gerard. Gerard, are you here? Hello. So how are you, Gerard? Ready for the very, talk? Very good, very good. I'm ready. Good. So, so we are all excited. So uh, I will not delay it any further. Just go ahead. The stage is yours. OK. Let me share the screen very quickly. All right, so here we are. This is, a, this is my first talk after lockdown, so I'm pretty excited. And we are going to talk about offline first and also how we can make it easy using GraphQL and Amplify Data Store. So I'm going to introduce Amplify um, during this talk and then how Amplify uses GraphQL to make this uh, possible. So let's, let's start with a little bit of an intro. Um, okay. All right, so I'd like to, I'd like to start my, my talks, making sure that everyone knows who I am. So this is uh, my name, uh, Gerard Sanz, and I've been doing talks for quite a while now. I'm a developer advocate at AWS, and you can see here some pictures with, uh, with Percy. Also, you can see my, my cap, Santa Cruz cap, and some of the places that I've been. I mean, of course, this was before, before you know, uh, COVID. But yeah, I, I, I think I was very lucky to do all this traveling before, before that, of course. Whenever everything resumes, I will try to get back on, uh, on my travels. But let's get started. So what, what does it mean offline first? 
And I want to cover this because a lot of, um, I think a lot of web developers, they don't, they don't really understand what means offline because I mean, web is online, no? I mean, it's a little bit confusing. So what, what do I mean with offline first? Well, let's start with this. I don't know if you, if you have ever tried. So whenever you are offline and you get the dinosaur in, uh, in Chrome, you can, actually, you can actually play a game and you can see the dinosaur. I mean, you can use the space bar and, and just you know, try, try to beat the score. I mean, this is, this is fine and, and funny, but if I, want to, if I want to access my app, I want to see my app. I don't want to see a game. Uh, so that's, that's not really a good experience, is it? So what means offline first for web? Well, the first thing is that we don't want to get the dinosaur. I mean, we want to be offline ready and we want our users to be able to use the app. So that will be the first. The next thing is provide a great, a great user experience. And that means that for all the life cycle of the app, we want to provide the best user experience. We don't want the user to be going through pop-ups or be granting access to different areas. I mean, we, we just want to seamlessly, seamlessly transition from online to offline and from offline to online. And the user just uh, can use the app without having uh, to think about it too much. And of course, one of the first things that you will think about when you are offline is what happens with the data. I mean, if I'm, if I'm using you know, some app that has no data, like a game, I can, I can play the game, but maybe I want to store the score. So I will need some, some way to store that data. And we are gonna cover that uh, later on. We also want to get some native-like features. And, and this will come with progressive web apps. We will get a lot from, uh, from progressive web apps. But that's also the features that you expect when you are using your mobile. And then of course, if we are storing this data while we are offline, we want this data to, to be safe. We, don't, we want it to be secure and we want this data to be shared. I mean, as long as we are offline, we can store it on the device, but as long as we go online later on, we want this data to transition to, to online without us having to interact too much with this. And we just want to just use the app and in the background, this data can be then synchronized. So that's, that's more or less what I wanted to cover. I don't know if um, a lot of you have tried to get uh, this working for any of your web apps, but these are some things to take into account. So yeah, we are done with the first section, so you can feel very proud. I mean, this is gonna be fun, I hope, for everyone. So just a uh, pat in the back, uh, you did great on the first section. If you have any questions, just ask me at the end. So let's cover progressive web apps. I mean, we talk about these native-like features. So a lot of these we will get from progressive web apps. But what are exactly progressive web apps? I mean, if we put in this, in this uh, axis capabilities and reach, we have different types of apps. First, we have native applications, which has the most capabilities but they also have some issues when uh, you want to use these uh, applications in different operative systems and devices. So it's not, it's not always uh, compatible. If we build a native app, for example, for Android, it won't work in all devices. It will only work for Android. So PWA applications come more or less in the middle. They give you similar capabilities, but they, but they have uh, more reach. They can be used in more uh, places and devices, which makes them really interesting. 
And then finally, we have web or single page applications, which is probably what we are use, uh, more used, really. So these are a little bit of the different options. And we are going to look into the middle one, the progressive web apps. So what are the core requirements for progressive web apps? Well, the first one is security. And progressive web apps uh, only work when using HTTPS. And the main reason is because we have this data stored in the device, we want to be sure that this data is securely transferred. We don't want anyone to be looking at this data or tampering with this data. Another thing is that we don't want to store any code that could be malicious. When we are using PWAs, we are going to install some assets, some JavaScript and some other resources, and we want to make sure that these resources are safe. So we need this uh, channel and it needs to be secure. The next thing is we are going to be using what it's called a service worker. And the service worker is mainly going to give us offline. So all of these offline features we are gonna get mostly from the service worker. And I'm going to cover this a little bit uh, more later. The next thing that I want to talk is about the web app manifest. And this is how the application will be themed and will be configured to be used as an application in different devices. So for example, when we are installing our PWA app in the desktop, it will tell uh, by using the manifest how this application will look like to the user. And this is the same, for example, if we are using uh, iOS uh, phone, and that's gonna give us the configuration for that specific uh, device. So how the service worker help us online? So let's see how that would work. Imagine we have our single page application, we have this index HTML uh, page, and in our browser, we are going to request that page. One thing that we have now when using a service worker is it's gonna be sitting in the middle. So when I request, for example, the code for the app and some uh, image, it will go through the service worker and the service worker is going to look at this request and then make some actions. In this instance, because it's the first time that I'm going to request this uh, single page application, it's going to let this request go through. But it's also going to do a very smart thing. It's going to catch these assets on the device cache. And this will change depending on uh, where this PWA is uh, executing, but it's gonna store these files. And the next time it's gonna request these uh, resources, it's gonna use the catch. But we got these assets now going back to the browser. This is the last step. So this is how the service worker has been uh, helping us in that. So let's move to another scenario. And this is probably the most interesting for the service worker. So now we are offline. We just go offline. It could be, you know, you could turn the Wi-Fi on your desktop. You could also be using your mobile. Uh, maybe you are going into the underground. So you are now offline. And for some reason, you hit refresh. I mean, why? Why would you hit refresh when you are in the underground on a web application? Well that's where the service worker is going to help you. So you hit refresh, you are very daring, and you're just going to request these assets. I mean, this makes our service uh, single page application. So the service worker is going to look at these requests and is going to say, oh, look, I think I have this on my catch. So it's going to hit the catch and it's going to ignore the network. So somehow the service worker allows us to just avoid the network when it's offline, but still we get the full app. I mean, here we get in the JavaScript, we're also getting the images and the user can, can keep using the app as if it was online. So it's wonderful. 
this is this is the reaction from people looking at service worker magic for the first time i mean look at this face nice so we i think we we have covered progressive web apps we have covered service workers so let's move on and the next thing that i want to uh, cover is aws amplify and aws amplify is um, covering what we call full stack serverless and that means that we cover anything from the client up to the back end up to the cloud and including everything in between and aws amplify will help you develop these kind of apps today the app that i'm going to show you it's using view but everything else is using amplify to make it uh, happen so let's look at how AWS Amplify uh, works. So AWS Amplify, it's working for iOS, Android, web, and React Native. These are some options that uh, we offer. And you can see that Amplify is based on the Amplify framework, some developer tools, and then uh, the cloud services. And what we are going to use is the Amplify CLI to run all of the different uh, categories, what we call categories or services. And we are going to add this to our app and amplify its features. So here are some of the commands that you can use on uh, the Amplify CLI. And anytime that you start a new project, you will call Amplify init. Then you can add what we call categories, uh, which I'm going to introduce uh, later. And then once you are happy, you can push these categories into the cloud. <clears throat> so you can provision all of these services so you can, you can run uh, your app in the, in the cloud. Uh, later on, if you need to change anything, any of the categories of any of the resources, you can uh, still run Amplify Update and that will allow you to make any changes. So this is uh, how you're going to be interacting with Amplify. So let's see what, what are these categories? I mean, these categories are mainly uh, backed up by AWS services, and you can see here some of them. So these are covering our authentication API that's going to uh, provide us either REST APIs or GraphQL APIs. We also have uh, bots, analytics, uh, extended reality. There's also uh, features for storage, functions. I mean, there's everything in there. Hosting, also notifications. And we also added a lot of features for machine learning and artificial intelligence. So you can also add these features to your apps very easily. <clears throat> For this app that I'm going to show you and that I'm going to be making offline first, I'm going to use Auth and API for GraphQL. So that's a lot. I hope I, hope I didn't lost you in the process. So let's, let's look at this app. So I'm going to be building a chat, which I, I've called Chatty. And this is also part of a tutorial. You can, uh, you can navigate to this, uh, following this bit.ly chatty view tutorial, and you can follow the instructions there. So mainly what I'm going to do in the next uh, part of this talk is I'm going to make chatty a PWA app. <clears throat> so that's gonna be our next uh, section. So this is how it looks. Uh, it's mainly a uh, chat room, where people can register and then it's kind of a papuri. You can go and everybody's just chatting on the same room. I mean, I could add more rooms, but at this point it's just one big room just to demonstrate the features. And this is going to demonstrate Amplify Data Store, which I'm going to cover uh, right now. Maybe I can, I can start doing a little demo. Let's see if, if I can run a demo. Let me see here. Okay, I hidden the I hidden the URL so you cannot you know start uh, sending messages. But I'm going to um, I'm going to do something just to show you how it works. I'm using uh, my phone 
and I have a Chrome and a Firefox instance. And I'm just going to send uh, a message here. Let's put GraphQL is cool. And I can also show how I can use uh, emojis. Okay, let's see if it works. Yes, so I've, uh, I've been using uh, another client. I mean, I'm using the same uh, JR Sans and I'm using the same uh, user. And you can see that it has been updated on my desktop. So now I have my mobile talking to my desktop and they are all synchronized. I also have another, just to make it a little bit more interesting, I have another account, which is a robot. I mean, it's not a robot, it's me but I can, also, I can also write here. Okay, so this is the robot, boring, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is, this is, the, this is the demo. You can see that it's, a, it's just a chat, but let me show you how, how is using Amplify Data Store. And I'm going to be looking at the storage and this is, this is what we are going to be using. We are using Indexed TV. And I'm going to show you how the data store is working behind the scenes. So here are different fields. And I want to show you the user chatty. And this is the information uh, from the different messages. So this is the last message that we saw. And this is the local storage. So this is, this is very good for getting that offline feature. So right now I'm online, but if I went offline, this will be where my data will be stored. So that's, that's a really good feature that comes from Amplify Data Store. So let's, let's go back to the slides. I mean, this is just to show you how it's uh, working on the browser. And here, I'm going to show you more or less what is the architecture for this app. And this is the app that is already working. So it's still not ready for offline, but it has like some offline features. And here we can see that's the hosting. So I'm hosting all of my assets uh, using AWS Amplify, and that gives me a public uh, HTTP as URL that I can use. And this is how I'm able to use it on my phone and also my desktop. Then I'm also using an authentication. So I don't want anyone to be, uh, you know, writing messages to my uh, chat room. So I'm going to be asking people to register and then I can see also what is the user writing these messages. I didn't cover this on my demo, but maybe that now it's a good time because probably most of you don't know exactly what that means. So let me just hide this for a moment and just quickly show you what's, what's that, uh, how is that looking? So I'm going to just log in just to show you how, this is the, this is the control that comes uh, with Amplifier. So you actually just need to add it. And once you add it, you just get this information. So this is a, this is what I skip more or less. And that's being implemented using Amazon Cognito. The thing that we are going to focus for Amplify Data Store is the bit that uses AppSync and also Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, so far, I've shown you indexed DB that's on the browser, but the browser is going to be communicating using GraphQL with AppSync, which is a service that provides a GraphQL API and the resolvers to store and do all of the CRUD operations. And Amazon DynamoDB will be our data source. So that's the architecture we are going for. And the way we can get that architecture using the Amplify CLI is just running some commands. So we are going to initialize our app running Amplify init. Then I'm going to add authorization and I'm going to skip this because it's part of the chatty view app. And, and then we are going to add the GraphQL API. Once I'm done, 
I'm going to be calling Amplify Push and get all of these services set up for me, as I show you in the, that diagram before. One of the first things that I'm going to be doing following that process that I just show you is using a GraphQL schema. And this is the GraphQL schema that I'm using and that you have seen also in the browser, in the data store in the browser. So this is using this GraphQL directive, which is uh, called add model. And that's going to create the GraphQL API, the resolvers, and also all of the logic that creates, updates, and deletes uh, these records, these messages on the Amazon DynamoDB. So this is all done for me, which is uh, very nice. And the way it's going to work is it's going to use these type definitions and fields definitions to do all of that work. And I just use an ID, the user, because I want to know what user wrote what message, and then the message and also some way of knowing when that message is uh, being created. So then I can show a message, you know, before or after another, I can sort those messages. So this is, I think, is pretty straightforward uh, GraphQL uh, type. And that's the only thing that you need to create uh, this chatty app. So that's, that's something that I did before. And you can, you can check it following uh, the project, the URL that I gave before on the recording. And Amplify Data Store will behave different uh, when it's offline and when it goes online. So let's cover how it works when it's offline. So the first thing that is going to use is the models. And these models have been created during the steps that I showed you before. And that will be our API. And this API is actually not GraphQL. So you don't have to write any GraphQL query, but it will be the GraphQL engine that will create these uh, GraphQL queries for you. So that's the store engine. And that's going to use, in different devices, is going to use either IndexedDB or SQL Light. And that's what I show you in the demo. So let's see that information again very quickly. This is this information here. So this is the IndexedDB database. And actually, the information for Chatty for my app is here, as I showed you before. And this is following my uh, schema plus some other internal fields that are created in order to do the synchronizing uh, whenever I'm online. So let's go back to the slides. So this is covering when I'm offline. And this is great because then I can actually very securely store any data, any updates, any deletes, anything that I, I do while I'm offline. And then I can keep these changes and share them uh, when I'm online. So let's look what happens when I go online. Well, the way it works with Amplify Data Store is the storage engine is going to be communicating with the sync engine. And this is going to make this very easy. And one thing that you can imagine, I mean, in a chat, in a chat application, there's no many uh, room for errors because everyone has different messages. We are not sharing data. But you could imagine a, a scenario where I'm actually trying to change the same data. And this is when this sync engine can play uh, a better role because it can resolve conflicts very much like when you are using GitHub and there is a conflict, there's some uh, clash between the data. For the chat app, that's not going to happen and just the data is going to be shared. And the way it's going to work is going to use GraphQL and it's going to execute, you know, the different uh, messages that I've used or I create or I've um, manipulated while I was offline. And it's going to execute those through the GraphQL API uh, in AppSync. Okay, so that's a lot of information to take in. So how that looks like. Well, we have different uh, imports here. What I'm going to show you is um, the models. These models were created using the GraphQL schema. So that's going to follow exactly the definition that you use in your schema. And 
is just using this data store save and is using the model to create a new object. And as you can see, there's no GraphQL involved, which is uh, quite interesting. That's going to create a record in our IndexedDB uh, database. And whenever I go online or offline, it's going to look if there are any changes and run GraphQL queries to synchronize. So that's going to be happening behind the scenes. So as a developer or even as the user, I won't see, I won't be involved in that. So that's going to be happening automatically. And the way queries work is very similar. So we are using these models. I get the model from uh, my GraphQL schema. And then I can just run some queries and I can use, for example, these predicates all, which is just a filter. So I want to get like all of the messages. And that's what I'm going to be using in my code. So that's a little bit of an intro of uh, how Amplify Data Store works and how it's going to help us implement this um, offline first application. So we are right on the money and we are now progressing after section, after section, after section, we are making good progress. Let's see the time. I still have some time. So let's make it a PWA. And we have covered what are the features that we are after. So let's see how we do that. And when using Vue, we can run a Vue uh, CLI plugin, which is called PWA. So it's very easy to remember. And we just need to run Vue at at view slash PWA. That's going to make some changes in your uh, view app. And mainly, it's going to make a change on your main uh, GS file. And it's going to import this register service worker. I mean, if you remember when I talk about the service worker, that's going to catch any of the requests so we can use these assets while offline. So this is, this is very good in that direction. So we are getting a service worker right after running one uh, command. So that's really good. The next thing we do need to do is just build. I mean, we want to test uh, that the service worker is, is fine. And that's going to create a lot of different uh, resources. Here, this is very similar if you have published any view uh, application. So that's uh, pretty much standard. The only thing is that we get a version attached to every file. So we can then tell the device that there's a change on that file and that file is going to be replaced. So the next thing that I want to focus is this manifest. And this is how the PWA is going to uh, behave when we install it. So we can define uh, the behavior and some of the different uh, configuration uh, values. There's also this pre-cache manifest, and this is all of the files that I want my service worker to install uh, when I'm using the PWA for the first time. So that's going to be part of the install, and that's going to tell uh, the service worker what files I want on my device before the user uh, starts using the app. Okay, and then of course the service worker, and that's the implementation of our service worker. So if we want to run this uh, locally, we can use this uh, HTTP server, and this is probably the, the nicest option. You don't want to be deploying this every time that you make a small change. So that's, that would be my recommendation for, for local testing, and that will work as, as expected. So use, use that. But still, so that's probably the only thing that you have to do and you will get working unless you have other things going on. So for example, in my app, I have a SVG and that's the logo, but the logo doesn't come, you know, by default. And of course, this setup from the PWA uh, BU CLI plugin didn't cover that. I mean, this is something that I need to customize, but that's one of the issues that I found when I was doing this work. So I had to think, okay, what resources I need when the application is offline? And then obviously I realized when I was testing. So this is, this is the first. So one thing that you can do is change the setup uh, that comes by default and use a custom configuration. And this is what involves. 
So we need to take the manifest. One of the things that I want to um, show you is probably the manifest. So let's look at the manifest. Let's, this is the, this is the solution. And this is what the manifest contains. So we have like some uh, properties for the name of the application, what will be the color of the theme, some icons. These icons are here for different uh, devices. So this is uh, for Android devices. And there's also uh, what is the way that I want to display this application. In this case, I'm gonna use a standalone. So it will look like a separate app. Um, one, one thing that we'll do is also change the result of my uh, index HTML. So if I go to the this folder, when I build this app, I can see where this information is going. Some of the information is going to go into my metadata here, and that's gonna provide these uh, different experiences. You can see, for example, this is for a Microsoft application and that's using the black color. And this is exactly what we seen here. So we can see how this uh, configuration in the manifest is telling uh, the compiler how to set my index HTML file um, in, a right, in a right way. So that's, that's what covers the manifest. So that's going to give that application feeling. And let's see, let's see, let's go back. Uh, let's go back to the custom configuration and okay. So here we can see that the manifest now it's on a, a view Interact. config file and this view config file will allow- Sorry to, to interrupt you, but you are not sharing your screen. So oh. could you fix that? Uh, sure. So here we can see uh, for the custom configuration, I need to add a new file, which is this view config file. And then I can, I can move the manifest from my, uh, this folder to my public folder. So then I can manipulate uh, the manifest. And then I can also set some of this uh, configuration uh, here on this PWA uh, property. So let's go and check some of this. So this is just a different way of uh, setting the manifest and the properties. Some of these properties now I can access them from here, also making it uh, available for um, Apple mobile devices and also setting some of these uh, configurations. The plugin that we are using is Warp, it's called Workbox and the custom configuration it needs to be set inject manifest. So that's going to use the manifest that I'm setting out in this uh, file. That also points to the service worker. And this is uh, the service worker that I'm gonna be uh, using for my app. So we just moved some of the default configuration into this file and now we can play uh, with all these features. Uh, one thing that you need to do when you do this custom uh, configuration is actually you need to develop this service worker. I mean, there's a lot of templates out there. This one is just showing uh, what I've used. So I can prefix uh, the entry uh, of my cache and I can use Amplify Data Store. I can also set how is this service worker going to behave? And these are different um, settings that I can set up. Mostly these are referring of when there is a new version how I want the service worker to behave. Uh, for this setup, it's just going to take the latest version, it's going to use it as quick as possible. Uh, there's other settings that I can ask the user, and maybe you have seen this in some applications, and then you can just refresh and pick, uh, show a pop-up and then uh, make the user click, decide if they want to go with the latest version or keep, keep the, the current one. This is how I fix the error. So one thing that I had to do is I need to add this uh, SVG file uh, manually. And that's pretty much it. The rest is exactly as the default uh, behavior. So that's the only change that I had to do. So it's, I, think, I think it's reasonable. 
So now we got the PWA uh, working. I got also another cat here for a little mental break for you. So let's go and see what is this new chatty PWA app, you know, giving to us. So we got this new um, version of our app and now we can use it in different places. So now it's interesting because we can use it on web, on the browser, but we can also use it in our mobile as if it was a mobile app. We can install it on our home screen. We can play with it. We can use it as if it was another app. It looks like a standalone app. So it's pretty cool. There's also the desktop option, so I can also install it in my Mac, in my Windows, in my Linux. So that's kind of, a, kind of awesome. I did some screenshots and I asked some friends to just screen capture. I mean, this is, this is a little bit. Uh, so you need to look for the chatty. This is how it looks in Android on the left and um, on an iPhone on the right. You can see that they look exactly like a native app, but they are PWAs. And then when they are using the app, they look exactly as you would expect. So this is this is uh, what you get. So that's I think that's pretty pretty cool. Another thing that we get is um, we get all of the uh, performance uh, coming from this uh, service worker. I mean, if you are even if you are online because you have this catch uh, content, you will get this first load really fast. You just need to go through that install phase but once you have your assets installed the first load will be really fast for your users and they also will be able to use your app offline but it's not really 100 percent online ready and why is that well it it survives offline and let me just show you i mean i think we are in a good we are in a good time now for a, a little bit harder setup and I'm going just to use this version here. I'm going to go offline. Don't do it. Don't do it at home. It seems like Gerard is trying to demonstrate uh, the offline capabilities really hard. But okay, fun aside. Uh, let's wait a couple of seconds till he reconnects. So uh, I, I guess Gerard went like a bit too hard with presentation and it's, it's, it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some technical issues, they are always there. Uh, so, so sure. Uh, I definitely have a few more questions uh, for, for you, uh, if you, if you allow. Uh, and if you would allow me first, I, yeah, I sure. just looked at the chat and I noticed Václav actually asked a question about uh, schema and I double checked that. So I have some corrections to make. DGraph actually does support schema. So that's small thing to notice. And it actually supports GraphQL schema, which is highly enforceable. So that's something that might help people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was uh, for Vatslav uh, question, whether yep. you can enforce some kind of schema in a Neo4j. But it's only for graph, uh, DGraph. It's only for DGraph, for, mm. for Neo4j, no. No, you, you can enforce some uh, limitation there and like it's like uh, an SQL, you, you have some similar something like that, yeah. Uh, Dushan is asking uh, in the chat uh, whether you can provide more examples uh, which apps are good for GraphDB and which are not. Also, does the query result uh, returns JSON, which is more of a technical one. So let's go one by one. Uh, as I said, if you have a lot of connected data, then I totally recommend GraphDB. Like uh, you can imagine like a lot of people connected to social network, for sure it's a really good example. Like people like each other, connect, share stuff. So that's a really good example for it. And actually I think even Facebook, they run some kind of uh, graph database uh, with the hood for like people finding or like connection finding. Talking about the way the data returned, it can be different. Like if you talk in Neo4j, there are several protocols. Uh, it can be actually 
to even JSON. It had been binary, it's a bot protocol. And the other thing, uh, the rest is actually up to how you set up. So you can even uh, connect uh, GraphQL there as a basically precursor, as, as I showed in the slides, and it will return to you the data as GraphQL data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe it will be sort of the amateur question, but uh, I, I wanted to ask whether you had a, a practic practical case or or whether you wanted to or if you can find a case where you would need sort of the hybrid database that oh, yeah. okay there is a lot of relationships but for a, for a certain entity there would be a, a, a really great use case to use uh, just uh, the relation relational da database the, the normal uh, table to, to 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 store the data as a list sort of Absolutely. Oh I, I completely, I completely, of course, I, uh, I was offline. <laughs> it's, all right. Sorry about that. I, I, I'm a little bit crazy and I didn't realize that. Yeah, no, no, no worries. No worries, Gerard. Uh, we realized and made a few jokes, uh, whether you are testing this Amplify, uh, some in, in in some some real for real and in this uh, kind of hard use case uh, in front of the audience yeah 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 i mean that's uh, that's embarrassing <laughs> yeah okay. if, if if that if if that's the case it's not working <laughs> no just joking <laughs> it's working it's working it's working but uh, there's other ways there's other ways i mean i just i just need to go through uh, if we have time i have like a couple of uh, slides yeah sure uh but we were in the middle of the conversation with alex but alex we can postpone it and gerard you can just fluently continue where you left off uh so you can finish your talk okay let's let's go back to the demo i mean the demo is it's possible but okay yep. let's so we we covered all of this so we got we got actually almost everything. The only problem is that whenever we are offline, the user doesn't know, doesn't know if it's offline or not. What I did is I added this feature, which I'm gonna show you. And this is uh, just adding a new property. And what I'm gonna use is the data store is gonna provide me a event with the network status. And I'm going to use that to change that property offline. And then I can use that to show a message. And that's the only thing that I had to do to make this uh, work. And that, that's the demo. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate now. I hope I don't, I don't mess it up again. And of course, there's another way of making the app you know, <laughs> offline. Oops. And this is just changing this. I mean, this is not going to break anything. And you can see the message. So this is now detecting uh, if I'm offline or not. This is just to show you that that's working. And another thing that you can see is, oh, I can actually show you, I can actually show you. So I'm going to, I'm going to go offline and I'm going, I'm going to write another, this is another. offline message and now I'm offline I mean it's only my browser and I'm gonna clear this so you can see how the synchronization happens and here I'm gonna very quickly go to the application and I'm going to look at my um, data on an Amplify data store and I'm gonna look at the last message and here my last message is the previous one which I, I obviously messed up. This is an offline message. I mean, this is the previous one, which is already here, but I'm going to create another message while offline, which is the demo that I wanted to do. So I'm going to create that. And this is going to add a new entry here. And I'm going to refresh and I get the new message. So this is the message that I created offline. Of course, what I want to see now is I want to go 
online and I want to see a GraphQL query being executed. And I see it here. So let's see which one is the GraphQL query. And here I can see that there's a create a chatty. This is uh, the result, but I want to see the actual query. And the query is a mutation. Let's see. Let's see if I can. Well, this is the, the mutation here. You can see it uh, now on the message. You can see there's an input. This is an argument. And that's going to call create, create chatty with um, an input, which is the information from uh, my message. In this case is when it was created, the ID, this is another offline, offline message and the user. And that's going to execute this GraphQL uh, query, which is a mutation. And that's going to up, upgrade the rest of the clients. Any, any other applications and devices that are listening uh, to this uh, GraphQL API, they are going to receive the subscription update from this mutation. So that's, that's finally the demo. And of course, now because I'm online, this message has been now shared with the other clients. So this is, uh, this is the demo. I mean, sorry about, I, this is the first time I did this talk and it's a little bit embarrassing, but okay. So that's the change uh, when it's offline. And this is a little bit of a overview summarizing. Uh, of course, PWAs are faster because we have this pre-catch content. They can work offline. They can work as a separate full screen app on different devices. Uh, they also have nat nat native uh, like features. So yeah, I hope I, uh, I explained, I covered how uh, offline first apps should be implemented and how we use PWAs uh, to do that. So that's uh, mainly uh, the end slide. Everything is possible. You get this cat uh, in the universe uh, as a background, DJing a pizza. So everything is, everything is cool. And if you want, um, just go and try it. You can get all of the source uh, from the PWA settings that I, uh, I showed here. You can also go through the uh, tutorial that I showed before and that's uh, that's pretty much it thanks thanks for listening and sorry sorry again for that uh, uh, issue so that's that's all uh, thanks uh, thank you no worries uh, no worries Gerard uh, these things uh, may happen uh, it's really ironic that it happened uh, once <laughs> you were talking about the offline capabilities and how to improve the offline UX, uh, which is uh, pretty funny uh, on its yeah, own. Yeah. So, 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 so it was it was great either way. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm used to hearing awesome talks by you, and this was no less awesome. Uh, Thank uh, you. Despite the technical difficulties, so no worries there for sure. Uh, we have a couple of questions here ready, uh, so let's dive into them. Uh, so this one is, is pretty specific, uh, but hopefully you will understand it properly. Uh, do you have experience with combination of Amplify and Terraform? Usually our DevOps guys want to know exactly what they need to spin up in cloud. My experience is that you want to test Amplify in, uh, in company and all you get is a lot of permissions denied and if you run it in your personal account i had hard time to let amplify to describe in detail what it is creating so i can provide list of resources and permissions to our platform guys yeah 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 um, i mean um so amplify it's um you know it's covering these full stack serverless apps and the idea is it, it is for people that is not, you know, experience in in the cloud. You can also use it as an expert, but this is this is more a tool for people that wants to start using the cloud. 
but it's not experience, it's not as experience. And that's why the CLI is so important. So you can run some commands and these commands, of course, they have what um, the technology being used is cloud, uh, cloud formation templates. So these will be the commands that will be executed on the, on the cloud to create all of these services that we are going to consume. And the services that you need on the back end, so you can run everything and everything works. Of course, I mean, if you are asking, how can I get my hands into these templates? I mean, I wouldn't recommend you to go and do that because I mean, it can break everything. So mm -hmm. it's, more, it's more like, can I have access to your bundles? I mean, why you want to have access to my bundles? <laughs> it's dangerous. I think if you try to change the JavaScript in a bundle, it's probably going to break, no? I mean, it's not, it's not a good thing. But of course, if you are you know, experienced and you are thinking like, oh, I would like to see these templates so I can look how, Amplify, how the Amplify team is thinking about um, this and then seeing like maybe you I mean maybe you agree maybe you don't agree on the you know on the configuration and then you can maybe take that and change it and that that would be terraform I mean if, if you're using uh, cloud formation templates on your own you can just decide everything of course amplify as a CLI it's giving you like some nice defaults and it's giving you like some you know uh, how it's called uh, strong opinions uh, about things. So you yeah. would say like, oh, we decided that this is the best for this beginner user. Or we think that when you set up uh, a web application, this is the best setup. But you may agree, you may not agree. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different opinions. So you may say, oh, I don't like this template is okay you don't like the template but this is the template we are using <laughs> it's a uh, of course if you want to go to another level a more advanced level then you can decide every single detail but amplify has made these decisions for you so it's giving you like a nice you know experience overall so that's i mean that's a compromise um, what i would say is that if you are in a business environment of course there's a lot of rules there's a lot of policies there's a lot of uh, settings just uh, that the organization decided on their own there's no way that a tool will will know i mean how how amplify will know that you decided to close a port or decided to make something uh, unavailable so it's not that easy i don't think there's a an easy way to answer that question the only issue with Amplify is that it has like some strong opinions. Sometimes these opinions will have, you know, issues, but that's because you change something. It's not because of Amplify, it's because you decided to close some ports or you decided to, I mean, this is your security policies. It has nothing to do with Amplify. Mm -hmm. Dushan, I hope that this answer was enough. It was quite understandable. Uh, that, thank, thanks a lot, uh, Gerard. Uh, Dushan asked some more uh, if this was not sufficient. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Next question. Ne yeah, next question is how do you handle sync conflicts? If you co can go into more detail there, or yeah, yeah, sure. So there's the strategy that um, that by default is set up is the last wins. So if there's, I mean, this is also used in databases. So what, what happens is if you change the same value, but you change the same value later, like you come later, that second uh, change is gonna win. And this is the easiest one. I mean, if you think about it, you get like two mutations from GraphQL, you, you don't need to do anything. It's just, you know, the last mutation changes the value. It was five, then it was 10. So it's mm -hmm. 10 now. And if it's the opposite order, then it's gonna be five. Because if the first change is 10, but the second change is five, then wins, the last one wins. Uh, not every system can work well with that. So if you have, uh, if you have like some way of a, a way to decide, you can do the same with, uh, you know, GitHub. So there's a conflict, you can either decide I mean, you can also show like a, a pop-up to the user and say, look, there's a conflict. 
how you, how you want to sort it out. So that's also a, an option that you can implement, or you can also uh, use um, an implementation using a Lambda, and then you can see both changes, and then you can decide like what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do with this situation. Yeah, but but the def you, as I understand it, that the def the default is that the lightest wins. Yes, and you cannot idea. influence it uh, anyhow. Oh no, you can influence it if you want to change that conflict resolution. You can use uh, anything between mm -hmm. the default behavior to a custom uh, behavior, mm -hmm. which will be uh, using a lambda, and then the function will decide. So you can mm -hmm. then do. I mean, maybe you want to show a pop-up to the user, so the user yeah. can decide. Or maybe you have so, a way to decide. Uh, okay, but it's custom, it can be Yeah, you can implement, so, so, yeah. you can, yeah, you can sure. implement up to a custom uh, mm -hmm. conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. so, sounds great. Uh, the next question is, is the whole state only in indexed DB? Yes. Yes, it is. So that was answered. And about the cost of Amplify, what's the minimal cost for the Amplify stack? So when you when you want to use Amplify, you need to create an AWS account. And mm -hmm. usually, when you create an AWS account for the first time, you have uh, an option which is called the free tire, which lasts for one year. And then there's a, you know there's some quotas. I mean, this is not unlimited but it's pretty good, it's pretty good. I mean, it just depends what you are doing because you can do anything from you know, machine learning to uh, use uh, a database or there's so many services. You need to look at the service. And of course, I mean, this is good enough to try it. And of course, if you want to use it in a you know, production app, then you need to do some calculations. Mm -hmm. But usually the price is, uh, is, is quite cheap. I mean, of course, depend on usage, but you can yeah. you can get like a year, like a year worth of um, test, let's say. To experiment. Yeah, the, the, yeah, because it's pretty pretty hard to define what the minimal cost is. So like the minimal cost is that what uh, nobody is using it, but it's uh, somehow running and is ready, or what's the minimal cost? Uh, but yeah, that was quite a sufficient answer. You have some year for up to one year where you can try it and it's pretty reasonable and then uh, it's reasonably cheap unless you are just a heavy user then exactly. it's, it probably sums up obviously uh, okay that was all from the audience so oh. thanks a lot uh, Gerard for answering all the questions which were here uh, and uh, once again, no, no worries. Uh, it was it was really great. So thank you for for giving us a heads up. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. For for the AWS Amplify. Uh, okay, guys. So let's wrap it up. Uh, uh, I will invite you all to our Slack channel. So feel free to discuss some more there. If you feel like it, uh, go to, go to uh, reactiveonlinemeetups.slike.com, uh, join. Uh, there is a history uh, with all the previous talks. Uh, there will be discussion to the current, uh, current talks. Uh, also, speakers are there available, so feel free to ask there. Uh, also, you will, have an, uh, op uh, you will have an option to uh, to give us a feedback and fill the feedback form uh, for us uh, after the, this uh, this stream is over. So please do so. Give us some suggestion how to improve. Uh, please do not mention that uh, uh, some 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 someone went offline during uh, during this talk. <laughs> this is something which you just cannot influence. So uh, just please be reasonable there uh, and, uh, and 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 give us give us uh, your opinions, uh, maybe some topic suggestions. We will just go through everything and we will try to reflect it and imp improve ourselves. Uh, and yep, that's it. Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening, all of you. Uh, thank you for joining. They, there will be another editions of the reactive uh, online meetups. So just stay tuned. Uh,
uh, we will inform about the topics, speakers, and the date about everything on the social networks, Twitter and Facebook. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you and uh, cheers. Goodbye, everybody.